So let's now quickly forget the proof and use the result to compute the base estimate of AF equals G for normal distributions. Okay, first of all, uh, we want to find an image F given some observed data from, from data G. And uh, there's a measurement operator, an observation operator A, and somehow we also have to take noise into account. So that's the background as usual. Think of it as the radon operator um, and uh, the image we want to reconstruct and uh, some data G. And um, of course, as usual in this chapter, uh, everything is assumed to be finite dimensional. Okay, uh, first of all, we uh, need a stochastic model for that, a statistical model for that. And uh, we assume that f is a random variable as well. Um, so uh, why maybe could that make, se make sense? Well, look at these two images over here. And let us assume that um, I cannot differentiate. For some reason, I know that uh, one of these two images is the true one. Um, so probably you would choose the lower one rather than the upper one. You would, somehow you would say, okay, that this is the true image, whatever you wanted to depict, that this is the true image is probably ve is very improbable. And uh, so what you inherently do is you assign a probability to images. And um, so it make, absolutely makes sense to view images as a random variable. And uh, in our uh, simple model here, we will assume that uh, the image is drawn from a pool of images, whatever they, that may be, could be all images, and uh, that, they are ran that they are normally distributed with uh, a known medium value and a known variance, a, var a covariance matrix. And uh, let me also quickly interpret that. Um, assume that uh, you want to reconstruct a heart, so you know that the output will be an image of the heart. So uh, if you take all the images, then there will be some average image, some mean image, and uh, that would probably be the, um, the image of, um, of a general heart, whatever that may be. Right? So uh, you might have an idea what the image actually looks like, and that could be the uh, medium value over here. If you have no idea what the image looks like, it makes sense to just take zero. Uh, what about the covariance? Well, um, neighboring pixels um, should the the bright, for example, the brightness in neighboring pixels should probably not be independent like it is in the uppercase over here, because with a high probability uh, in, in a real image, um, the um, brightness values in neighboring pixels will be almost the same. I mean, there could be an edge, but with a high probability, they're more or less the same. So the covariance between these two will, so these two will be highly correlated uh, if uh, the two uh, uh, pixels are close to each other and they will not be so much correlated when they're away from each other. So we would assume that somehow the covariance depends on the distance between two pixels. And that is actually um, a good um, model for the covariance. And uh, I think I will show you some images, what that, uh, some things where that boils up down to, what that boils down to. But uh, anyway, we can assume that uh, we know what the average image is, could be zero, and we know what the covariance of images in our pool is. Okay, and of course, we assume that everything is normally distributed, which, uh, which is a very hard assumption. Okay, we also want to take noise into account. So as before, we have an, uh, a vector M of a random variables um, and uh, Ni, uh, same dimension as the data, of course. And uh, as before, we assume that uh, the uh, medium, uh, the mean value of n is zero. So if we measure an infinite number of times, then uh, we get the real value, we get the correct value. And we assume that uh, the um, ni are independent. So that means that uh, the uh, that one noise component does not impact the other one. 
And uh, that means that the covariance is a diagonal matrix. And we assume that the variance of each and i is the same for all. So uh, uh, the covariance matrix is something, something like sigma squared times i. So n is 0 sigma squared times i normally distributed. And we uh, interpret sigma square as the noise strength. If sigma is large, then there's also a lot of noise. OK, uh, now even more assumptions, and they're maybe even more dubious. Um, we assume that f and n are uncorrelated. That means I assume that the noise distribution does not change when f is changed. You can think of many situations where this is not going to be true. But to keep things simple, um, I assume that at this point, so we assume that f does not affect the noise distribution. OK, um, now we have two. Um, normally distributed random variables, f and m, which are uncorrelated. So that means that uh, the common distribution of, uh, the, um, of random variable f and n uh, is also a normal distribution with parameters. Well, of course, the, medium val the mean value is f0 and 0. And the variance, since I assumed that these two are not correlated, that f and n are not correlated, uh, the, co the covariance matrix is given by f0, 0, sigma squared i. OK, um, now we have that observation. So uh, we measure some g, which is a times f plus n, and n is the noise. f is our drawn image. So f and n are random variables. So that means a f plus n is also the observation that we make is also a random variable. And as again, a is the observation operator. So think of the discretized radon transform or whatever. OK, so g is a random variable as well. And we can look at the joint distribution of f and g. Um, now, since f and g is i0, a, i, f, n, uh, then fg is now also a random variable. And um, one thing, I, I think I didn't note this uh, when I wrote, when I defined it, but from the definition of the normal distribution, it's clear that uh, when x is normally distributed, then bx is also normally distributed for any b. So uh, our theorems 1 and 2 from the last video tell me that e of bx is b times e of x, so, uh, and um, in, um, the covariance of bx is b times the covariance of xb transpose that we proved. So uh, that means that first f and g is normally distributed, and the parameters for the normal distribution are given by the expected value of f and g, which is just the expected value of i0 or i applied to fn, according to this definition. And taking the E inside due to this property, due to linearity, we have that this is just F bar and A F bar. And uh, that's not very much of a surprise, right? I mean, if I have a mean, medium um, uh, image, then the medium measurement will be something like uh, A times that medium image, mean image. OK, so uh, what about the covariance? Well, that can also easily be done now, since uh, we have that fg is uh, i0 ai times fn. Uh, applying the uh, theorem for the covariance, we get that uh, the covariance of fng is i0 ai, this is this matrix, times the covariance of, uh, of, F, uh, of f n, which was, excuse me, f0, 0, 0 sigma squared i times b transpose. So that's i a transpose 0 and i. Oh, and I should, uh, of course, I should mention at some point, I'm also always writing i here for the identity matrix. Um, of course, there are two identity matrices here, right? Uh, this is the n-dimensional identity matrix. Uh, it's as large as the image. This is the m-dimensional uh, in the identity matrix, which is as large as the data, but um, I don't um, give the, uh, I don't indicate this here because it's always clear. 
Okay, uh, now multiplying this to these two gives this one. Uh, multiplying with this matrix gives F, F, A transpose, A, F, A, F, A transpose plus sigma squared I. So this is the covariance matrix of the common distribution F, G. Okay, uh, now viewing this in light of the last theorem of the uh, last video, um, this matrix is already partitioned like we want it to be, to be. So this is K11, K12, K12 transpose and K22 from the last image, from the last theorem. Okay, uh, again, and now we look at uh, the conditional uh, probability of f uh, given that g is g tilde. Okay, we already know that this conditional over here is again normally distributed and we've computed in that last theorem the expected value and the variance. We expect, we are interested in the expected value here and what we wrote down or what we proved was that the expected value of f given that g is g tilde in exactly this setting over here is F bar, uh, so the mean medium value of F, plus K12, K22 to the minus 1, G tilde minus A F bar, where uh, K12 and K22 are given by this one over here. And this one is in red because I did it wrong the first time. Okay, so this is nothing but F bar plus F A transpose, A F A transpose plus sigma squared I to the minus one times G tilde minus I A F bar. And I did nothing but just insert K11 and K22 over here. Okay, in a way that looks already a lot like Tikhonov. So um, let's make it look like Tikhonov even more. And let's assume that F is the identity matrix. Um, I said that definitely F is not a diagonal operator, but for simplicity, let's just uh, assume it at this point. Then uh, we get that uh, the base estimate for F, which is given exactly as the expected value of F, given that G is G tilde, is given as uh, F bar plus A transpose, A A transpose plus sigma squared I to the minus one G tilde minus A F bar. And um, well, that looks almost like Tikhonov. And uh, I will convince you that it is Tikhonov because if we take a uh, look at this term over here, A transpose times A A transpose plus sigma squared I, then I can take the A transpose in and out of the, on the right hand side. So this is nothing but A transpose A plus sigma squared I times A transpose. And uh, since A transpose A plus sigma squared I is invertible if uh, sigma is not zero and this one is invertible as well, that's something we proved a long time ago, uh, we have that A transpose A plus sigma squared I to the minus one A transpose is A transpose A, A transpose plus sigma squared I to the minus one. And you see that this is just the matrix up here. So I can replace this term over here. And we have that F base is also given as, and this should be in green because this is the final result, is given as F bar plus A transpose A plus sigma squared I to the minus one A transpose G tilde minus A F bar. Okay, now um, assume that the average uh, image is zero. Then this is just A transpose A plus sigma squared I to the minus one A transpose G tilde. And that's exactly taken off. Okay, what we have here then is a uh, kicking off for the two norm for the solution of a f plus f bar is g and where we're trying to find f over here. And um, so what kicking off then does is uh, it tries to minimize uh, the uh, deviation from f bar. So uh, also with, uh, with this definition of Tikhonov here, we have the idea that F bar should be something like a medium image, uh, like a mean image, and uh, that uh, the image that we come up with should not deviate too much from that image. So that absolutely makes sense also for, uh, for Tikhonov, not only by st statistical means. And so this is done something, that, this is something that's also done for the uh, normal Tikhonov. Okay, so uh, this estimate that we have over here um, is that that's actually that's actually Tikhonov. 
um, if f is uh, so, and f um, um, the, the uh, in the Tikhonov uh, regime that uh, f bar is also called the prior. So if you uh, if you read um, medical reconstruction literature on this, then uh, the, this is the prior, and that should be something like a medium hard image. Okay, uh, what happens uh, if f is not equal to i? Well, then this is a slight gener generalization of uh, Tikhonov. And uh, if you look at it exactly, then uh, you find that uh, this is actually boils down to doing Tikhonov with a different norm. And uh, since, uh, and that's quite normal, I think we employ, I think we usually um, uh, use Tikhonov with the uh, norm of the gradient. So just using it with the two norm is actually something that's unusual. And uh, again, it's also also in the statistical sense, of course, it's unusual because F is not going to be um, um, a diagonal matrix and definitely not the identity matrix. Okay, so we get a generalization of Tikhonov here, um, but gen in general, we get Tikhonov. Um, and uh, one thing that's nice is uh, that uh, when we define Tikhonov, we had that regularization parameter, which just fell out of space. Uh, and we just defined it. It had no physical meaning, whatever. Uh, but now it does, because uh, the role of the regularization parameter, that's now this sigma squared. And that had a very nice statistical meaning. So that was the size of the variance. So um, that's a very nice thing. Um, we can really attribute a meaning to that regularization parameter now. And that give, also gives us an idea of how we should generally choose, even if we're forgetting about the statistics, how we should choose the regular regularization parameter in the Tikhonov method. Okay, so all in all, stochastic modeling or statistical modeling gives a generalization of Tikhonov in this case. And actually, it turns out that uh, whenever you assume that uh, you have random, that, that you have a random noise that's uh, normally distributed, Usually what you come up with is a Tikhonov method, maybe a variant of that, but um, more or less we are, we are getting exactly the same thing that we started off with in, I think, chapter two. Okay, this is nice to know that coming from a completely different approach, you get more or less the same result, but also it's somewhat disappointing because, of course, we uh, also introduced statistical modeling so uh, we could come up with something new. And the thing is that to get something that's new, uh, we must use a different noise, something with a different noise distribution. And so that's why we're going to emission tomography, but because here, of course, we have Poisson variables and uh, not um, we have Poisson variables and not normally distributed variables.